everyone, my name's Elizabeth and I am a marine biologist who shares what I learn on here on YouTube every single Wednesday. I am an avid rock pooler, I'm currently doing a PhD and I love anything marine or beach related and I put out questions on my social media, on my Twitter and Instagram for you guys to ask me anything about marine biology or my life. So that is what today's video is going to be. So grab a cup of tea, sit down, snuggle up and get ready to chat. So the first question is what made you want to study marine biology? Which I think is a pretty good question to start off this Q&A session. Unfortunately, I don't have an amazing answer. I don't have a person that inspired me. I didn't have a event in my life that moved me so much that I wanted to become a marine biologist. Actually, I can't remember when I decided that I wanted to become a marine biologist. Um, I just always have. Um, I asked my parents and they can't remember. No one can remember the point at which I decided I wanted to be a marine biologist. That is how young I decided I wanted to be one. I remember a teacher signing like your t-shirt and I think I was eight because I was just moving uh, into middle school and I remember them drawing a dolphin and saying good luck being a marine biologist and I remember being annoyed then my eight-year-old self that they drew a dolphin and I was like it's not all dolphins so I knew enough at age eight that not only did I want to be a marine biologist but I knew about the job itself and it's definitely not something that my parents would have ever pushed on me and it's definitely not something that I got into because I suppose it's that dolphin trainer thing which ugh, I really hate but like that's that stereotypical like young child wants to train dolphins which it never ever was for me. Uh, the only thing I can say is that I grew up right near the sea, I explored beaches, I went fishing, I really really enjoyed anything marine even from a young age and I love watching things like Steve Irwin, his documentary series so I think some I don't know, something along that must have clicked and I must have realised what a marine biologist was. Um, and I am then very stubborn and did never ever even occur to me to change my mind. So that is why I wanted to become a marine biologist. I would actually genuinely pay a lot of money to go back in time to like just to see what weird thought made me decide to become a marine biologist because I imagine it was something bizarre and it would be quite nice to know. Maybe a psychic could tell me. It must be in my memories somewhere. Next question is, what is your favorite beach to rock pool on? And this is one I'm quite excited to answer because I have been asked before and I realize I've never really explained where the name Marine Mumbles, which is the name of this channel, comes from. And I talk about rock pooling a lot and most of the videos are centered around that and scientific art. So if you do want to subscribe to Marine Mumbles, then uh, now would be a handy time to just head down and do that. And it would be doing me a big favor. Um, but I called and picked Marine Mumbles because I lived and did my undergrad in Swansea, which is uh, a little city uh, on the south coast of Wales and right at the end of Swansea Bay which is this big massive gorgeous beach is a headland called Mumbles and this is honestly one of my most favourite places on the planet and it's really cool because you have Mumbles Head with um, this like a uh, pier that comes out and that's really cool to rock pool around you can find giant starfish and tons of mussels and really the tide can go really far out or it can be really far in so you can find some really weird stuff i've seen lobsters there and it's a really awesome place uh, to check out to rock pool but if you head round, you can see there's like a lighthouse and there's a whole shore there that you can rock pool and the other side of the lighthouse is a little bay called bracelet bay and that is like all that together combined is my favorite place to rock pool because bracelet bay is this little hidden gorgeous little bay where i first went rock pooling it's where we went rock pooling for our undergrad courses 
and as a result it is somewhere that i discovered so many new creatures that i didn't know existed it blew my mind this is this is where my mind was blown on bracelet bay and round on mumbles and it's just so special to me it's the first time i saw a blue ray limpet the first time i held a devil crab which i absolutely love it was where i saw baby wrasse and all these unbelievably amazing and incredible species all in this one little cute bay and i loved it and i love to go back every time i'm in swansea and i miss that part of the world with my whole heart so that was the reason i really i called my thing marine mumbles was because i was doing so much marine stuff in mumbles but also because you can see mumbles headland from basically anywhere in swansea bay so it was a real good reminder to keep going at it and i i just love the place so much and always a good tip for a rock crawling spot is to find somewhere with a really good cafe really close there's mumbles pier cafe which is just amazing it has like the great great burgers has great ice cream there's fish and chips there's like toasted tea cakes if you just wanted a coffee and the best hot chocolates which are so needed after a long rock pool and you can go to the arcades and there's a fishing shop and then if you wanted to be fancy you could go to actual mumbles but like that whole little unit within such a small space is just so perfect and i loved that swansea was right right there ready to explore so that is by far my favorite beach so link to that what are some things you really want to find in tide pools but haven't seen yet <sighs> top of the list is an octopus i have never seen a wild octopus and i am desperate to I think, well, I mean, it's one of the most difficult things to find because they are absolutely amazing at blending in and uh, they are super smart, so would know to hide from big clunky human in her wellies. Um, but I'm just desperate, desperate to see one. I think I will burst into tears in the joy to see such an amazing and magnificent creature. Uh, so that is so on my list. Um, I really want to see a stalked jellyfish. I really want to find more nudibranchs. Um, uh, really, I've only ever seen one, one in its natural habitat, and I loved it so much. You can watch that video here. There's a lot of me just losing it over how awesome and amazing um, they are. But there are tons of species of nudibranch, and I really want to work my way through as many as possible. And the other thing I really want to find that I have seen before um, is a devil crab again, but I haven't actually found a devil crab when I've had my nice uh, red camera, that, uh, my Olympus TG5, which is amazing at video footage, and I really, really want to get some footage of that amazing crab because it is my favourite species. I love barnacles to death, and barnacles as a group are my entire favorite group of species but my favorite individual species is a devil crab and they are just too cool <laughs> so what is my favorite fish species um my favorite fish species struggling to say that Oof. don't know why uh is probably bass actually because it's just got really nice memories of uh fishing for them and uh when i was a kid that it was just the most magnificent fish they are built for muscle and speed and really like they're silver and they've got these spikes and their spines and they, they they're just a beast of a fish you could just see that it's almost a fish species that it, it's just so beautiful for, for its purpose it's it's like the perfect predator fish and I really, really loved them and that was one of the first species where I started to clock the differences between different fish species and why a bass has to look like how it looks um, and I found that really incredible. So that, uh, Ben, is my favourite bass species. No, fish species. It is a bass. What? Right, I'm trying to mix it up, trying to add some variety in. We've still got lots more questions to come, guys, so stay tuned. 
Uh, but let's swap to some sort of different question now. Uh, what is one piece of advice you could give to someone looking at marine studies? Things like uh, a master's and a PhD. Now I'm gonna break the rules slightly and split these up into two categories, one being master's and one being PhD. So in the UK, from my experience, a, a master's is a year and it can be taught based or it can be research based. And my advice for either of those is do something fun and different. It's gonna be a tough year doing research, if you're doing research masters particularly, because doing research in one year is always a difficult feat because in research things go wrong and you just have a much less turn, quick turnaround time. But it's one year you can I, I just think that if you're gonna move somewhere, you can move anywhere and stick it out for a year. I mean, obviously you don't have to move, but if you're thinking of moving, then a master's is kind of a really good time to do it because it's one year and you know you can walk away from it at the end. It's one year to try something new. Do something you haven't done in your undergrad or you thought was interesting in your undergrad and didn't have a chance to. It's your chance to try something really, really neat. If you can get a master's doing something you have dreamed of doing, whether that's something stereotypical, as amazing as, as uh, being in the tropics, or in my case, I actually swapped into engineering for my master's and um, did uh, a master's looking at biofouling so I got to look at the engineering side of the things that how you know things the material that marine life settle on influences each other and you know if I I ended up loving that and that has completely changed the direction of my research and I now do a PhD in an engineering department but I'm still doing marine biology I, I just get to, to learn more about the engineering side at the same time, which I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do had I not done the masters. Advice for masters, just embrace it. Know that it's gonna be a hard year, but just have fun with it. The advice kind of shifts a bit with the PhD um, in that do not wing whatever you choose to go for. Don't pick something for a PhD that you think is interesting, uh, but you don't really know a lot about. So uh, from my experiences for applying for a PhD, you have to apply with like a two page spread of how you would interpret either the project that's been allocated or if the project is very vague, what you would want to do as a project. And for every single PhD you apply for, take those two pages and really read about it, really take it seriously. Because when I say you have to love what you do in a PhD, I mean you have to love it more than anything else. Obviously, the realms of normal life don't apply. You know, family, spare time, that sort of stuff. Um, but within your academic field, within your academic life, it has to be something you love. You don't have to know everything about it. But if you read and make, write those two pages and you get bored writing those two pages and, and think it's a bit mm, then, I mean, <sighs> it's difficult because PhDs are a bit like gold dust. You have to convince people you've never met before to put a lot of money into your furthering your education and a research project that you are kind of taking on and pitching. But you will get to a point in your PhD where everything will grate on you and everything will be hard, things will go wrong. Yeah, well, it's just the fact that everything goes wrong, it's a weird work environment, you're spending three years of your life doing this. And the difference between a PhD and undergrad is, in an undergrad you have so much variety, it's different modules every term and you have six modules on the go at a time and um, it's kind of over and you get a break in the mid uh, in, during summer and you get Christmases off and this will be the same topic every single day for three years. That might have been a bit of a rant, but if that is something that you guys watching are interested in and you want to know more about anything to do with the P my, P my PhD experience or my postgrad experience, then comment below and um, it might be that I can make another video or if it's just a quick question I can reply to you down there. So I'm uh, here and happy to help uh, if needs be. What is the best non-marine thing 
you have found on a beach. Oh, technically I should go get this, one second. So I don't know if you're gonna count this as cheating, but I would say the best marine thing I've, non-marine thing I've found on the beach is this shark's tooth. And by non-marine, I'm going to go with not alive. This should be one of the smaller back teeth of a fossilized great white shark, which I found on my local beach um, on uh, the Isle of Sheppey, which I actually filmed. So head over to check out that video if you're interested. Uh, someone has asked if I have the book, Marine Animals of Southern New England and New York. No, I don't. Um, I am from the south of England, but not south of New England, which is across the seas. However, I do appreciate a good book recommendation. So this is stored in my head for if I ever head over American coasts and then I know what book to get. And I do, however, have a lot of books. So I can get where you asked because my extension, my extension, my collection is getting quite extensive. Thank you for the recommendation. So the same person asked, how fun are sculpins? And I didn't know what sculpins were. Um, just not a term I'd come across. So of course, Google came to the rescue. And uh, I would say they're pretty fun, but also pretty, pretty serious. The only sculpin that I've really had any hands-on experience with having Googled what they were, um, are sea scorpions and the only time I've ever seen sea scorpions are if we've been researching and done like a, a beach seine which is like a, a net where you catch some fish and see what's living in the habitat and put them all back nice and safely and uh, sea scorpions don't care about you they are hardy and they are going to survive well beyond your years probably <laughs> they, they'll probably live the same amount as a fish but they look at you like you're like, you may think you're the bigger human, that you're big and scary and that you intimidate us, but we're gonna win in the end. Like they're really, like <laughs> we've got that type of personality. So yeah, I would say they're fun, but they're also very serious fish. Let me know in the comments below um, what you think. And if I got the definition of sculpting right, if it's that group of fish, just in case I'm really, really wrong. Um, someone has asked what has been the most rewarding experience thus far, academic or non-academic, which really got me thinking. That was a deep thinker question. So I've thought about that a lot over the last week or so since I got the question. Um, I mean, the first thing that pops into my head, and I think the thing that I'm definitely going to have to go with, is getting my undergrad degree. Um, that was a really special day finding out that I had got my degree and that my grade was a good one um, I ended up getting first because uni was such an amazing experience because you got to learn about so many different things and you got to meet so many different people and mixed in with all of that life still goes on and it's your first time away from home and life doesn't always go your way and sometimes it throws some stuff at you and it was a real roller coaster my undergrad and i was just so unbelievably grateful and i worked so unbelievably hard for those results at the end and i didn't expect to get as good as I did um, and I did really well in my last year and I didn't expect that to happen and it was just no one can take that away from you once you have that and working so hard for three years towards something and then having it all with the, a click of a button and getting that result flash up is something that I have never taken for granted, that I will never take for granted, and it just kind of instills confidence in you that I've just ran with. I mean, I haven't really stopped since I 
got those results, I took them and ran and it has opened up so many doors for me and given me so much confidence to open those doors um, that hard work pays off and I think that's probably the most rewarding thing I've done so far but check back in with me when I've got fingers crossed got this PhD because I definitely think that one's gonna top it <laughs> really hope it does <laughs> so that has been the most rewarding thing so far Nudibrag Appreciation Society asks, what is your favourite nudibrag? It is, I don't know how to say it, so I will try and pronounce it terribly and probably fail at spelling it on the screen now. Aedolia papalosa? It's just, first of all I love the name. It's terrible to pronounce, but I just think it's like a really, really cool name. And I really, really like them. And I think they've got a bundle of personality in, in this thing. Oh, I think they're really pretty and awesome. And so that's my favourite nudibranch. <laughs> uh, what is your favourite nudibranch fact? My favourite nudibranch fact is um, I love that they eat uh, hydroids which have nematocysts, which are like stinging cells in jellyfish, and they can eat that, and that means that they can sting or, yeah, basically sting or poison. I don't know. Hmm. I'm gonna go with sting, so that if a predator comes along and eats a nudibranch, um, they will be irritated internally <laughs> uh, by uh, this, and so that's how they protect themselves. They literally become, it's a perfect example of you are what you eat, and I wish I could eat stinging cells because that seems so much more fun than normal food. Um, and how many nudibranchs live in Scotland? Um, I don't know. <laughs> what I go for off of nudibranchs that I want to tick off my list is uh, this amazing website here, and they have pictures of 56 species of nudibranch in the UK. So I am assuming that there are 56 or more species of nudibranch in the UK, and I don't know how many of them live in Scotland. A good YouTuber, marine biologist or researcher would research this more and they would use distribution maps which we have uh, online where you can search in a species and it tells you where it's been found but I'm really sorry I don't have time to do that yet however I will chase this up and it will slip in as a fact in a future video I promise I just don't have time and I haven't had time in the last couple of weeks to properly flesh out that fact so I'm sorry to disappoint so anywhere in the world to do marine biology and learn more marine stuff or where would you go mm, everywhere <laughs> i would say that the place i really 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 want to go is probably the classic it would be australia just because they have amazing rocky shore ecosystems that would be completely different in species to what I'm used to. I could dive and see sharks and I of course would love to visit um, the full on barrier reef um, and coral reefs and amazing ecosystems that Australia have. So that is probably top of my list. But way up there is um, Canada. I want to see all the stuff in Canada, the amazing marine mammals and just the stuff, just all their marine life sounds amazing and awesome. So Canada would be up there. I really want to go, I've been to Orkney and Shetland, which is in the UK, uh, but I'd really love to go there and study the stuff that's there because it's like rocky shore species on steroids. It's, they're having to deal with really harsh stuff and really cold and really dramatic. I love me some dramatic ecology and dramatic species stuff. So I'd love to go there, even though it's a bit closer to home. I'd love to do that. Um, and really, I'd love to go anywhere it would take me. I'd love to see a kelp forest, like a giant kelp forest. I'd love to go um, to Antarctica or the Arctic and go on a research vessel and stay on it for a couple of months and just 
go and live at sea it would be so cool so um it's a really difficult question to answer because there is so much i haven't done yet and so much i just hope things crossed at some point um, i will be able to do but who knows so someone asked they would like to know how to start and share facts about rays and sharks but don't know quite how to start any advice on how to make the first approach what I would say about this is you have to remember that you probably have a lot more knowledge than the people you're trying to communicate to because in life you know if we spend a significant chunk of our time learning one thing we kind of start to forget uh, how much we've learned if we've gone on and how much other people you know haven't read about sharks or rays so I would start off remembering to go super super simple you want to tell people what a shark is what a ray is where you can find them if you can find them near you maybe things like how dangerous are they really because that's something that people are going to want to ask straight away and um you might want to tell people if you know how long they live um what they look like start off using really simple language nothing um, uh, taxonomic so you don't have to say dorsal fin you just say fin and describe where it is on the body or use pictures i would say if you're looking for somewhere to share then twitter is an amazing place to share um, online facts with far better than instagram because you can retweet and um, it's much easier to tag people and it really can snowball a lot easier than Instagram would. So I would recommend Twitter over Instagram. I would recommend if you wanted to take it really seriously, then maybe start a website or a YouTube, but that's something that you don't want to start or set up until you way down the line. Really, I wouldn't jump into that. I've loved how it has pushed me to keep producing content and to keep um and, well basically hold myself accountable to share content but if you're really just starting out then twitter is a great place to kind of delve into learning if that's going to be something that you want to do if you want to continue sharing and if people are responding to that then you know you could start a blog and link the twitter to a blog but i would just start off sharing facts um come up with fun ways to share facts you can sh do short videos on twitter you can do pictures to share to twitter um just use anything that's going to make it interesting and share that i hope that's been some help but there is a video coming out soon that's timetable doing for sometime soon um, on sharing science online so i'm going to have a lot more information about advice and that um in the coming weeks so make sure to subscribe if that's something you want to be interested in and comment let me know so that I can make sure um, if you have any more questions surrounding that area that they get included in that video. What is the best barnacle and why? Um, slightly difficult to answer because they're all awesome <laughs> because lots of barnacles are relatively similar. There was some really, really cool species called Megabalanus, which can become giant barnacles, and I think they are really, really awesome. So I would say that they're pretty, pretty cool. But that's not really a barnacle you see in the UK. So I would say the best barnacle is just the plain, common, simple, semi-balanus balanoides. It's your reliable, go-to, always gonna be there barnacle. It's just, it's it's a comfort barnacle, if you will. Is there really any more to say than that? <laughs> Thank you for watching. I know this has been a bit of a long Q&A. If you have any more questions about uh, anything to do with what you've heard today or anything more, then please just comment below. I'll get the notification and reply to you as soon as I can. I promise. So have a great week. Until next time when I'll be posting a video for next Wednesday evening. Have a fab week. Till then. Bye guys.